Welcome to Core Concepts. Core Concepts Lectures uh, are, is a place where we bring people to tell us what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it. And this is sponsored by one community, by the Institute of Applied Metaphysics, the Church of Revelation, and I Am Well, an association of healers. And in this, uh, today, we have with us Keith Blanchard. Now, Keith was the very first person to do a Core Concepts lecture. Mm -hmm. You were number one. And, uh, but today, he's in there, he talked about his work and so forth, but I wanted to get some information out about Sai Baba and uh, about, the, about this man. And Keith has had such a, an unusual experience in, um, in how he came to, to meet Sai Baba and so forth. So I asked him if he would come and talk to us today. Welcome, welcome, Keith. And Thank you. Go ahead. I want to tell you a beautiful story. That story is, has not yet had an ending. It's actually my life that I'm living. All of my life I pursued, at least played with the idea of being plugged into the cosmic system. That started to manifest early in my life as an ultra boy. Age of 15, I was serious about it in such a way that I wanted to become a Catholic priest. My dad introduces the guitar, God goes to the closet and the guitar stays out. <laughs> <laughs> and so the picture that I'm painting, the path I was walking was uh, a lot of fun being a musician full time. But there was a lot of roadblocks that I was unconsciously creating in my life because of not using certain principles, spiritual principles, ideas, and incorporating that in my life to where I was aware that I was creating all the wonderful things as well as all the things I really didn't want to have happen. But I did not have the tools that would allow me uh, to expand my awareness to not only make me believe that I was creating everything in my experience, but be absolutely convinced that I am not disconnected from the grid, the cosmic grid, that everything is responding to me by how I affect it. Years of my life after I became, uh, years later, after I became a spiritual teacher back in the say mid-90s, um, I was do, teaching a class. And a friend of mine by the name of Paul came to me after the class and we were talking about this wall who had, that had a bunch of uh, spiritual deities, Mother Teresa, Buddha, Christ, Babaji, and so forth and so on. Excuse me. And there was one picture in particular, I remember it was the father's pic, the last picture. And I asked him about some of the different deities, who were they, where they're from, and what's their mission statement. Well, he gets to Sathya Sai Baba, and he proceeds to tell me a little bit. I said, well, tell me a little more about it. And he reaches down from the altar that was below all these pictures, and he pulls out this little canister. Full of what's called Vibhuti Ash. And he said that Sai Baba has the ability to manifest that will, to spontaneously create this out of his hand. He would literally walk up to you, turn his hand, or just pour it on you out of his hand. And the fact I was new on the spiritual path, um, I was really intrigued because some of the guys I would hang around with, we would talk this really cool spiritual stuff how you can become a master and really be able to create your experience in a very grand way. So these kinds of ideas introduced for chatting between uh, me and my mates was really exciting stuff. And so I decided that I wanted to know more about this person uh, who can really manifest that will. And so I began to read, well, he showed me the, this ash, and this is the ritual. And the purpose is, it's an excuse to connect to God. It's the thought, it's the sincerity, the fact that you're taking time and creating an intention to connect to something greater than you know as yourself. It's an act of humility to kill, not really kill the ego, to tame the ego, or to see it from the perspective and the purpose that it is. So it's a way of connecting to God. But also, the metaphor is that everything in the temporal world will burn or eventually reduce itself to ash. So all that is left is the ever-present spirit. But it's also a warning 
to the recipient that you must begin to burn um, all of the troubles, all of your woes, all of your discretions, all your faults into the fires of worship. This is the purpose of the ash. This is what it means. So I was intrigued. If you want to look at it, you're welcome to pass that around. Um, I was really intrigued. So I began to read books about Sathya Sarvada's life. Keep in mind that this being does not write books. People write books about him. Uh, there's no other way to say it. Uh, if you believed that God has ever walked the earth, that's what he looks like right there. And Adam, Jesus and Buddha is what you call yogis. These are men who over the course of their life, they become one with God through rituals and practice and desire and passion to be one with God consciousness. Sai Baba is an avatar. An avatar is born with God consciousness. He was born enlightened. In fact, his name is Sathya Sai Baba. Sathya means truth. Sai means mother. Baba means father. Like Abba in the Bible means father. So he is an androgynous being. Pretty much. So he embodies the full divine flame. Masculine and feminine principle. He, he died about two years ago on Easter Sunday. Um, but the people who are writing these books about Sathya Sai Baba, in fact, he's the highest, to use a word, the highest incarnation of God who, that has ever stepped foot on this planet. Uh, a Mahavatar, we talked about yogis and avatars, a Mahavatar, in fact, is not born at all. They literally have the will and the power to man manifest themselves spontaneously out of whatever dimension they're in. Baba Ji was such a person. But we're speaking about Sai Baba. So I started reading books about his life. Doctors, scientists, people who don't believe in his God stuff, going over there to disprove all this noise they're here. <laughs> these are the people that came back to write these books about this avatar saying, I don't know what that was, because that's nothing like I've ever experienced. So as I started reading this very first book, in fact, it was called My Baba and I where Sai Baba met this man by the name of John Hissel. And they were walking down a dry river bottom to find a place to have a ceremony, 12 people. And Sai Baba walks up to this bush and plucks these two twigs. And he holds them like this in his hand and he tells Hissel. He says, Hissel, what's that? He goes, well, Swami, that looks like a cross. He goes, watch this. And he blows his, in his hand, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is worse from singing. He blows in his hand three times, and there lay an actual crucifix with Christ hanging on it. And he said, this actually took me some time, he's being funny because he just blew in his hand. He said, this actually took me some time to search throughout the universe to find the actual elements that were this piece of wood that was in his hand from the actual crucifixion. Okay. These are some really far-fetched stories. But I was intrigued nonetheless. <laughs> and I was willing to venture into the rabbit hole, however that far that rabbit hole went. So I started reading book after book after book. And he started coming to me in dreams. And there's a, there's a common theme throughout all the books, which is that he's told all these authors that met him and wrote their stories that whenever I come to you in a dream, you are not dreaming. Because if your mind has to paint the picture of God, you're already operating on that conscious level. So therefore you are being visited. Because to him, to me, that's who he represents to me. And to whoever he is appearing to. And so... He starts coming to me in dreams, showing me things, showing me cosmic occurrences, bringing me through different dimensions, talking to me. And one night he comes to me and he says, I may get emotional. It brings back such a magic <clears throat> for me. He 
bring me to a state of full blown consciousness. As conscious as I am in this room right now. And he's standing across the river. Thank you, I'm okay. He's standing across the river and he's talking to me telepathically. And my, my, my remembrance is he tapped me on my spiritual knee to jar me out of sleep, to wake me up. And he's standing across the river and he's telling me, come to India. And I started wondering, how will I get there? Where will I get the money? How will I put all this together? And he's laughing at me from across the river and I can hear him and he says, Keith, you're going to have to learn to transcend doubt, your disbelief, what you think is real, possible, all these things. He painted this picture and it was given to me in an impression that was encoded. But I knew everything he was saying because it was like he threw a ball of light at me basically and it had everything in it that he wanted to say. So he says, transcend your doubt and disbelief and come see me in India. Okay. So the next morning I wake up and that's the first thing thought in my mind. Man, that was so real. It was real. So I, I, I started to play the game with myself again about how will I make this trip happen? And something snapped inside. And I said, I made a decision. I'm going to go to India. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from someone I've never met. And she says, hi, Keith, my name is Debbie. We have a mutual friend. I hear that you want to go to India to see a holy man. I said, yeah, this is true. She says, well, I'm a flight attendant. And I have some companion passes for the year that are about to expire. And I really would like to give one to you so you can go to India. So I went to India, first class. Round trip, no expense to me, to go witness the divinity of this man. And I, I can't and shouldn't, but I can't begin to express what it was like to see how divinity acts and behaves. There is a grace that happens when he walked into the temple that could only come from something divine. It's like there's a, it, he glides, there's a song when he walks. So I get to India, miracle upon miracle was happening the whole journey, my way there. Um, I saw him on the plane, I was sleeping on the plane crossing the Atlantic Ocean. I wake up and I see this avatar walking down the aisle. I don't know why this is so emotional for me today. Um, it's kind of like it's refueling a fire. But I saw this avatar walking towards me down the aisle of this plane, superimposed on one of the um, flight attendants. And then I would open a book after I swallowed and processed that experience to open up a book at random to say that most people talk about how when they come see me in India that if there's an, uh, an empty seat next to them they can feel my presence. And so these types of miracles were happening soon as I got underway. Um, soldiers with machine guns watching over me. I felt no fear. I had absolute trust. It was suggested I should get um, vaccinations for the diseases and conditions I can be susceptible to. And I decided I wouldn't do that. My intention is not to go, to, to go there to be sick. Besides, God invited me. He's not going to bring me across the country, across the world, to get, you know, malaria or whatever it is, you know, that people get there. Um, the first day I got to the ashram, I was late considering the fact that Darshan, which is the blessing of a holy man, was about to happen because 35,000 people had been waiting for hours and I just got there. So the guy at the orientation often says, put your stuff down here, run down the street, take a left, take a right, take a left, go in the temple, so Baba's about to come out. So I'm running as fast as a human being can possibly run to God as a metaphor. <laughs> 
And so I get to the temple, and I'm, I'm last. Everything happens in a hub. And thousands of people, they sit you as close as you can possibly sit in an Indian lotus position. Here, here, people on each side, forever, in a sea of people. There's a path where he walks down this red carpet that have lotus petals imprinted on the, on the carpet every three feet, insinuating God is walking. He should be walking on red carpet. He should be walking in flowers. There's an integrity that is was so amazing while I was there. So I'm sitting in the back, and all of a sudden you hear this loud bell. Bang! 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 And then all of these people, 30 plus thousand people, go to this Om 21 times. And the temple's made to resonate tones. And you can feel what is, I would say, like the breath of God. You can feel it. You can feel everyone's intention as to why they are there. And you feel that intention being reflected back to you by everyone that's there. Because you're part of the crowd, but yet you are an individual. And so it's the energy begins to vibrate like a tuning fork. So finally, Sai Baba comes out of the gate on the right, on the women's side. And I didn't believe what was happening. I was like, <laughs> tattoo of Sai Baba. <laughs> That's Sai Baba. I'm in India. <laughs> Had a drink too much ago. <laughs> and it actualized itself in a big way. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know. I just knew that, wow, this is really happening. And everything that I read for two years, studied, all the videos I watched, the experiences I had with him in my sleep, for two years, led me to that moment. I didn't know how to process that gift. Because what he stands for, for me, at least at that period of my life, was everything I think everyone in the world, the universe, has been looking for. That's how close to the best scenario I could have gotten for myself. And when I saw that and realized this is real, all of it for two and a half years solidified for me in that moment, just like that. My belief, my conviction, who I am changed. And I told myself, today I am not going to process anything. I'm too tired from the trip. I'm just going to see how they do it so that tomorrow I can step in and participate. The next day, make a long story short, I'll give you the routine, the rituals, how the darshan, blessing of a holy person happens. You wake up really early, 4.15, and it's cold. And you walk down a long path, and then you, you're walking to a concrete real estate where you sit in one of the road, a line at random, and if you don't sit down when you get there, one of the Seva dolls, which means an attendant, will say, you sit there. And everybody's called Sai Ram, which means everyone treats each other like God. It's kind of like Namaste. They receive the divine in you, so they call you Sai, Sai Ram. Sai Ram, you sit there. So all these rows, right? Let's say you have 16 rows. Row number one, two, three, four, and so on. But no matter what time you got there, doesn't if you got a row one, don't mean you're going first. They pick the numbers at random. Row 10, stand up. You're first. They march in the temple. And you literally get from here to the wall, for those uh, in the, uh, the viewing audience, three feet from what you would consider God. Um, and so they march you in there. Uh, you sit in absolute, the sea of people with nothing to do for two hours. After you sat in the beating hot sun, for one, and the reason I asked about this, what is the purpose? It says it creates humility. That you're patient, you learn patience, trust me. Uh, but it creates a humility in you that you want to see something so divine, it, it somehow creates the space of being worth it. And so after you sit there for a while, you hear this music way in the distance, and it's a parade. And the parade is to celebrate and wake up God on the earth. 
while he's still sleeping. And eventually he comes out. This is, happens about 6 in the morning. Sai Baba does not come out until about 7.15. Then all of a sudden they put some Hindi music on for a little while. Then they start clanging that bell. Well, the days that preceded, when Sai Baba would come into the temple, were like this. He walks in on the women's side. Women and men are separate because they want to avoid distraction. He walks in. He takes letters from people. Materializes objects for people. Heals some people. Talks to some people. Listens to some people. But when he got to my area, and I had the opportunity for the first time to be in the proximity, in fact, the first time I went to Darshan other than the initial day, I was always, literally, if I want to touch him, I could. And I have. There is something that happens when this little man turns his hand. And I'm not talking about only the fact that he can materialize objects out of thin air. Yeah, that's the bells and whistles. Woohoo! He can materialize things. But let's see it and give it the respect it deserves. You have to be connected to be so powerful that you can use your will to create spontaneously. When he starts to turn his hand, everyone is... 30,000 people are always watching him. That's why you're there. So your eyes never leave this person times 30 plus thousand people. So when he begins to turn his hand, to manifest something, to create a miracle, if you will. The expe expectation, the vision of 35,000 people, you can feel elevated. You can feel it just like that. And I've often wondered, does Sai Baba use that energy, use the force, it's all around you kind of thing, if he literally draws from those people to materialize these things. Make sense? Makes absolute sense. He wants to tap into the field. And he's able to tap. He is the field. He, if God is so conscious he can create a universe, just the idea of walking around in a body is, <laughs> is nothing. And so why would he do that? Why, why did he come here? He's here all the time. There are so many masters in India. They're everywhere. Yeah. But Sai Baba is significant, more recognized, for, for whatever reasons his mission was, but I had experienced, you know, this avatar's divinity in many ways. One with the sweet inviting me to India. Um, watching him materialize stuff spontaneous in front of me. Changing the weather. Telepathic. But in fact, there was this guy behind me one day. He said, do you mind if I reach over you and use your shoulder to give Sai Baba a letter that I wrote asking for prayers and blessings in my life? I said, absolutely not. So, like a script, Sai Baba came in. The guy reaches over my shoulder, pushes on my shoulder for support, and reaches and gives Sai Baba the letter. And Sai Baba knows everything that's on the letter. But he literally reads them out of respect. But he knows what's on the letter. But the reason he takes letters from people is so they can feel like their wishes were heard. That's probably more important to the person than what's actually on the letter. Because they have a wish already. The universe knows you wish. And becoming open by feeling you are heard, it, it's what opens you up. It's the feeling that I was heard, recognized. I'm being acknowledged. Two or more people in my name, God is present. So this guy's leaning over my shoulder, and Sai Baba walks up to him, and he, I saw it, I tell you, with every fiber of my being. He knew why he was walking to me. Whether that guy was involved, or that guy was just a puppet, a part of the script for something that I needed to learn and experience, Sai Baba was walking there on purpose. I saw him coming because he was doing his thing, and he, and he walks right over, and he looks at this in my direction, and then the guy stands up, and he hands him the letter. And Sai Baba never takes his eyes off the guy. He goes, you ought to know better than give me something like that. So Sai Baba walks off and I went, <laughs> what did you give him? No, he said, you ought to know better than give me something like that. You put that where it belongs. You put this through the channels to where it belongs. And I said, what did you give him? He said, I tried to give him some money. 
And I've seen these experiences and these types of manifestations um, everywhere, for example. When I was going to India, and I'm going to take some questions here so we can have some. When I was going to India, I was in midway of writing my book, The Divine Principle. I really enjoyed writing it, and it was probably about four years into it. That's a long time to write a book. But when I was awakened out of my sleep by that voice that morning, it, I was instructed to begin to log my thoughts, my feelings, and my life experiences, and that eventually turned into that book. Point being, I was at the halfway point, and I didn't want my trip to India to be about me and my book. But I, it was important to me because I did not want to put any more energy into something that was not valuable in the highest way to my life. If you know I'm spo supposed to be doing that, and that's where my highest life is, whatever, for whatever reason, that's what I want. Show me clearly. Keith, you play with this long enough? Yeah, don't worry about it. But if you want me to, I'm willing to take it to the end. And I said, I'm not going to go there the first day and start, teacher, teacher, ooh, 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 me, me, me. There will be a season for it, and I will know. And so about the second, going into the second week, maybe the eighth day, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to ask this master who knows what I'm thinking. There was no shame knowing that he knows what I'm thinking. He can see it anyway, and you know he knows it. So it literally shatters the shame. It shatters the guilt because he's looking at you from such a space of compassion and non-judgment. There's a power in that. Wow. That you can feel. It's very, very tangible. So the day comes. I, somehow I knew intuitively today is the day. Okay. How do I ask the question to get the best answer? The right answer, the answer that I truly understand without any doubt. I know. I read a book by Robert Pretty called The Source of the Dream, in which Sai, Robert Pretty went to see Sai Baba. And Sai Baba was pointing at Robert in the crowd, pointing and writing in the air with his finger like this. Sai Baba literally gave Robert Pretty an interview and said, you saw me doing that? He says, yes, what was that about? He says, I want you to write a book about my life and what you've experienced here with me. Also keep in mind, when Sai Baba interviews people, they're from all over the world, Russia, Egypt, China, America, he speaks one time and everyone in their language understands. So he told Robert, I want you to write a book about my life. So when that day came when I want to ask, should I continue with this work or not, give me the same sign you gave Robert Pretty. And his, <laughs> his hand goes up in the air and he starts writing. My human logic goes, is this really happening? <sighs> Do it again. And while I'm looking over here, because my eyes were closed, he's now over here. And he's writing in the air. So I said, okay, once, twice, thrice, and I was validated yet again. And so, after Sai Baba left the temple, this gentleman next to me was reading a book. And people often stick around to sing bhajans, uh, songs, songs to God. And he's reading, and I said, so, hey man, Sai Ram, what you, what you reading? He goes, oh, check this out. And the author was named Kenneth Blanchard. Okay, so I automatically see the comparison mm -hmm. to my last name. And I thought that was a big miracle. And I was cool because, one, I just got finished asking him, do I write the book? They would have a book with Blanchard on it, and there's that guy. Well, later that night, I'm going to take a shower, and I realized who Kenneth Blanchard is. My dad's brother is actually named Kenneth Blanchard, <laughs> who is my godfather. These kinds of manifestations were happening everywhere all day long. It was so rich. It was like five, six bites of cheesecake. You just had enough. Um, these are some of the experiences I've had with Sathya Sai Baba. Um, there are avatars everywhere if you're interested in knowing more about him. 
Um, I'd be more than happy to send you links, books. I have, believe it or not, I have an entire library of the 30, 40, whatever years he's given of discourses. I have the entire set. Um, he died two years ago um, on Easter. I have one more story I want to share with you. Um, most spiritual teachers, not meaning myself, but as often spoke through stories. This is a book called Love is My Form. It's truly a chronicle of everything about this human being. Well, divine being. I'm a form of human. Um, this story is way, way out there. It's kind of long, and I'll do what I can to keep it small. Ever since I was a child, um, I've been hearing in my consciousness the one that we knew that Jesus was going to return. Never really paid any attention to it. It was just a thought in my head. I'm just a silly kid. I was Catholic, so it makes sense to me, being a Catholic boy. Um, so I'm on the ashram. Well, as I, well, excuse me, let me back up. When I was writing The Divine Principle, there was a chapter in the book called uh, The Return of the Christ, meaning plural. Crisis. And I wasn't sure if it was going to make the final cut for a few reasons. Um, I was afraid. I was absolutely afraid. What it was I was afraid of, I didn't know. Probably what people would think if I would write such a chapter, because if you read the chapter, it's very prophetic. And that was very dangerous ground. I really didn't give a flip what people thought of me. But I didn't want to be blasphemic either. And so, one night after intense prayer, I keep hearing Keith write this chapter, write this chapter, Return of the Crisis. And I didn't know what to do. It was a good chapter, but I just didn't know if it was going to make the cut. So, two angels came to me one night in sleep. And they spoke in each ear, and I can hear them as if they were one voice, but I knew they were distinctly two different beings. And they said, Keith, we've been telling you since you were a child to log this information. So I did. I finally accepted the fact that I'm going to write this chapter and keep it. So one day while I was in India, in America I would take a nap every day. In India I didn't do it. I didn't feel the need. I'm walking around. And I buy this Japa Mala in the morning. There was a, a Japa Mala in the morning I bought and asked Sai Baba to bless it. He blessed this guy, this guy, this guy. He looks at me almost intensely, skips over me and keeps going. They give me an ignorant thought about it. Later that day, he comes out twice a day, one at 7.15 and one about 2, 2.30. Look, walking around buying souvenirs and I saw this cool Japa Mala and I wanted it. So I wanted it. So, and after, after I got it, um, I can feel that I was getting sleepy. Not because I needed a nap. It was as if something was inducing sleep in me. It wasn't me. It was something poking me. So I decided to go lay down and take this nap. And I was thrown into another full-blown conscious experience. You would think that as much as I dreamed about this avatar and my past in Memphis, the one I'm on the ashram, it would be all the time and very, very exaggerated. But it wasn't. I only had that one dream. It's kind of significant, actually, I think. And I find myself in a gymnasium-ish type place. Other people, not many, few here and there, 15 people, 20. And he's standing in the middle of what looks like a basketball court. And we're sitting in what would be sort of like bleachers. And he says, come, come, come. We got something to see. So everybody walks up to this crate. It's the Ark of the Covenant. Or it's at least as powerful and as special as the Ark of the Covenant is. It had scriptural writings, carvings, hieroglyphics. I mean, it was just imbued with divinity. It was solid gold. And we're all standing around this. And he says, let's everyone grab this cover. Let's lift it and let's see what's inside. <laughs> so we all reach down and we pick it up. And I see a crib, I see two goats, and I see a throne. And he looks to me, I'm going to tell you something you already know. And you have known since you've been born. He said, the one you know as Jesus will be born, implying the crib, through a family of goat herders, 
and will occupy the seat. And so, a little more to the experience, and then I woke up, and I was cussing mad. I was mad. And I, I was using every explicit I could think of. Now, I was cursing Sai Baba. I don't know why. It felt therapeutic. It felt like I was supposed to do it, as if I was venting out all the fear and all the demons as to why I was afraid to write the chapter in the first place. It felt purposeful. But yet, I wanted an answer. I really wanted an answer. If I'm going to stick my neck out there and mention this type of prophecy in our time, living in the Bible Belt, with all due respect, I want to be clear. Can we make that clear? <laughs> that was my attitude, really. <clears throat> and I knew that the prayer I was going to ask on this pretty beat that I just bought, I have to be very, very clear about it to get a very clear answer. And so my question was to God on this prayer, I need to know if through what I just dreamed about is valid in a human way, right in this world, that it is absolutely true that there is no figment of my imagination, there's no ego trying to be stroked here, blah, 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 blah. And I narrowed the prayer down after my intention to, is it valid? And I kept saying this for three hours, one hour in the beating hot sun and two hours in the temple. I sit down in the temple and I'm, first, I'm in the first row and I'm meditating on this beat, is it valid? And this gentleman, a Seva doll, sits in front of me knee to knee and he mirrors me. And he was so quiet, I didn't even know he was there. So when I opened my eyes, it, it surprised me, it took me back. And what I saw next changed my life. It validated to me that whether the story of Jesus returning is true or not, it's, it validated to me the, the purpose, even just of the story itself. When I looked at the guy, and I looked down, I see his badge, and his badge is turned backwards. And it says on it, Valid 2000. And that, he said, in fact, Sai Baba told me Jesus was going to be born in five months, which was June of 2000. So he said, and I saw Val 2000, and I said, excuse me, Siron, what is that? And he looks at me as if he's literally being a channel for a message. He goes, that means it's valid. Okay? Bang! <laughs> I just got hit by a spiritual truck. He turns his ID back around the other way, and if you know me, you know that my spiritual center is called the Yana O Center of Light. His, his name was Yana. He lived on Cross Street, Jesus. I mean, all these things point to the manifestation of something very, very powerful. So, so the shortest story, Sai Baba walks in, and I say the prayer one last time. Is this valid? He literally stops what he's doing, turns around, and walks in a beeline to me and blesses this bead. And I know that is exactly the reason he didn't bless that bead that morning. He skipped over me on purpose. When this man touched me, if you can imagine that there is a compressed light inside of you that literally becomes this amazing conflagration and explodes, I saw myself looking up at this avatar. I saw myself as the avatar looking down at me as the personality, and I saw what I would call the birth of the universe. And it's not like the way you would see it, or the way you would think it is that you saw. It's more of a knowing, and that knowing is vision, but the feeling that happens is where the pictures are. For me, the pictures were in the immense bliss. I started to become so emotionally overwhelmed, I had to leave. Not because I was, didn't want to be seen crying, because I wanted to show respect to other people. I was becoming a distraction. So I left. These are the types of experiences I've had with this avatar. And my life has been blessed. The teachings from this avatar are amazing. Again, if you uh, are interested in any uh, more exploration of Southeast Sai Baba, please feel free to let me know. Um, anybody have any questions? You, um, 
he says that that was his second incarnation. The first one being another Sai Baba, hmm. white, short hair. Yeah. Sai Baba that we've seen pictures of, that even my daughter-in-law's family are, are devoted to. And then this was his second one, and he is supposed, he says, he will come again for a third incarnation. Can you tell us anything about it? Yeah. Sai Baba was here in the late 1800s. His name was Prima Sai. Again, Sai meaning mother, meaning mother. Prima means love. That will be considered the second coming of Christ. Not Christ as the man, but Christ as the consciousness that's going to uh, occupy the world. And that's coming really, really soon. Sai Baba says the world's going to have peace by 2017, according to what he saw, the choices that we're making, and how the path is going to end up. Primasai's purpose as an avatar was to bring about secular integration between the Muslims and the Hindus. So what he would do, very smart man, he'd dress up one day like a Muslim and sleep in a mosque. The next, the next day he would dress up like a Hindu and sleep in a temple. And so he brought peace among the two nations. That was uh, Sai Baba uh, Primasai's mission. This avatar's mission was to help people see, which is the same three beings, it's the same energy, God, manifesting in all three, three, three people. Satya Sai Baba's mission was, is, to help mankind see that God dwells within each and every person. Absolute full potential is the right of every being. The third incarnation was supposed to happen now. So Sai Baba was supposed to die in 2000, many more years from now. But anyway, he checked out early. Even though he prophesied, how did he miss his own prophecy? Well, point is, now that the third one's coming, he's supposed to come back eight years after he died. But is that eight years by his first prophecy? Or is it eight years now since he died? He checked out early. That incarnation is going to be, uh, his name is going to be, uh, I, I was mistaken, excuse me. This avatar is going to be called Premasai. The first Sai Baba in the 1800s was Sai Baba of Shirdi. Shirdi is a state in India. This third incarnation is to help humanity see not only within every person does God dwell, each and every person alone is God. That will be the final mission of the avatar. This, this triple incarnation. Secular integration to rectify that, to bring people, yeah, to bring people together. Um, second avatar mission to help begin to create a fire within each human being. And the third avatar's mission is to see to it that the world achieves the full plan. Yes? I have two questions. Um, one, um, do you see a parallel or an equal relationship between Sai Baba and uh, Maitreya? Yes. And don't, aren't they the same? It's the same. And the, aren't their incarnations the same? They are the, I would agree, absolutely they are the same. But they do have personalities. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, so, yes. for they're, example, they're if, if God would be the hand, if God would be the whole hand, mm -hmm. and we are each a finger, mm -hmm. Christ, Maitreya, would be considered the knuckle. It's where individuality and full consciousness connect. But it's the connecting incarnations. The, the two are different. You know, Sai mm -hmm. Baba's here is Sai Baba, and Maitreya would be... Uh, it's a different incarnation. Now, isn't and, Maitreya supposed to be... Already here in in England. Yeah. Uh, I thought he was in. Uh, in a, I don't know. In the last time I read about him was several years. He was in Africa, but then. Africa, that's it. But this uh, this is uh, I don't know about that source, but that's what I've been yes. told. Yes, uh, Benjamin Krim. Krim, yeah. Um, Sai Baba is known would be known as the Cosmic Christ. Um, Maitreya is known as um, Planetary Cross. Planetary Lulus. Any other questions? Is that what was that? Uh, no, that's questions? not the end of it. <laughs> um, my feeling is, you say avatar, you say uh, great being, you say like, then you say this is God. So what is your definition of God, and how can you say this is God, just because you feel that, and all these thousands of people that go there feel that? That doesn't mean it. It could be anybody. But I mean, is 
I'm, I'm just wanting to see what, <coughs> why you call him God. That's a your very, very good question. I really appreciate your honesty. I think that's a beautiful question. And it's worthy to be answered, in my opinion. It's important. And I appreciate that you <laughs> had to, to ask me that question. Moxie. Yeah, yeah Moxie, what a great word. Absolutely. Um, I actually almost don't know the answer to that question, but I'll give it my best attempt. Well, see, you re kept repeating, this is God, this is God, this is God. Actually, God is, <clears throat> is the definition of a word that, you know, many people who are nowhere near the level of Sai Baba claim, you know. So, uh, I need better, um, I need a better definition, I need your definition. My definition of God is... Silence, love, unconditional, non-judgment, all those spiritual qualities we know. Okay. That being said, just as well as the unmanifest, so is the manifest. If God is omnipresent everywhere, then obviously you're it, the water's it, it's it's everything, it's the the place that it's the place in the universe, it's the space in the universe, it's the consciousness that knows everything. It knows it's not disconnected from everything, and it has the will to manipulate whatever it wants. And it knows it will live forever, and it's very blissful in knowing that. This man is the personification of that. He, yeah, he, he walks. His teachings can only come from a place that truly has to be consumed and burning in that, that fire. If, if, um, as a... Christian, or as the scriptures say, that God dwells in man and that we live, move, and have our being in God. There's omnipresence, omnipotent, omniscient. Would it be m more accurate, the definition to say is this man is more aware of it than anybody? He's conscious of the fact. Conscious of he is probably, as far as spiritual, he other high-level spiritual teachers. And when I use these words that describe high-low, I literally don't mean that. It's a way to understand the concept. But avatars themselves will have will tell you that he is the highest how about this? He is the highest form of consciousness to ever walk into human body on this planet. But there are avatars. That's I mean, a good yeah, and, you know, be it you enlightened, be you a yogi who's born and you become that, or you are that, you still that. But the point of that I was making about him uh, it, you could literally be seen as a light from the Godhead literally just manifesting itself on the planet and aware that it's doing so. For sure. That's good. That's a good definition. Does anybody have a question? I mean, could you tell? Did you have a question? If so much is going okay. well, right what now, about, I can't. Okay. The, what all, can you tell us anything about what he has done there in South India, what, what he created around... Uh, where he was that was so significant. He's created a village just by being who he is. He didn't do anything, he didn't coerce, he didn't ask for money, he doesn't. Just by walking and speaking scripture that he never even studied. I mean, recite the Bhagavad Gita like he wrote it. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. So he would walk as a child and he says, you better get a good look at me now, a few years hence, you will have to stand miles away, there will be such crowds. And his life is the testimony of that. But he's created this place, this refuge, this Prashanti Milium, the highest abode of peace is what it stands for. Created wells by materializing water out of the ground. Uh, it's created a hospital, created attracting people with lots of money, not because they want to show off their money. He doesn't need your money. But money is a vessel to build the world. And he uses that vessel. But he doesn't ask for it. And in a channel, they built this amazing hospital that nobody has to pay for. You sick, you go get treated, and you leave. And so he, he's done his work. Um, you know, one way that we can see this avatar, Christ, Maitreya, Jesus, Sai Baba stuff, if you take it out of the spiritual context for a second, my dear friend I just met, and I were discussing here in a metaphor. God wants to experience itself through us. It wants to play with itself through us. Why? I guess he has nothing else he, to do. Maybe he's bored. Maybe that's fun for it, obviously, because we're doing it. 
It's been taken out of spiritual context. These people are basically refining, who, refining themselves in such a way that they begin to tap into a part of themselves that really exists at, your, at our essence. And they're using it to manipulate energy. Call it energy reality. Well, they're saying, I've done it. I want you to do that too, just so I can show you how cool it is. Because I care about you, my brother, because we and sister, because we're connected. Here's the rule book. The cosmic rules apply to everybody. These are the laws. <laughs> These are the rules. When you understand the difference between the laws and the rules, you're on your way to becoming a master. Rules can be broken, laws can not. Well, the mm -hmm. point of spiritual beings is to eliminate that spirit spirituality to people who need it. Yeah. People who are searching, people who are are hungry. So that's that's that alone is the uh, raison d'etre. Well, the the people have it, who have increased their receptacle so that they have the capability to receive. See, this goes to that law of that equation that you can't pour a five-gallon drum of water into a quart jar. <laughs> you can, it ends up on the ground. So it's up to us to increase that receptacle so we can receive, because we can receive all there is. They just keep, and keep receiving, but you have to have the capability to receive. Absolutely. In fact, my friend and I, just a little while ago, we watched a video of Sai Baba materializing this much ash out of a jar about that big and about that big around. Just by putting his hand in. Uh, I'm going to leave you with the final thought. Any final questions? Any final questions? No, go ahead. And be sure and uh, mention your website, book, and uh, your connections there. How, how to connect you. Um, you can, uh, let me leave you with the thought box in my mind. I, I met this doctor once and we kind of got into this banter back and forth about God and he says I'm an atheist. And I said, okay. So uh, he says, Excuse I'm going to give you a medical doctor. A just medical. a doctor, someone in the field who didn't have the, the spiritual mindset nor the desire, just was lazy about it. And he was actually poking at me, just prying me a little bit, and want, wanting a challenge, and I accepted it. it was fun. He says, here's your one shot. <laughs> he says, convince me of God. I said, okay. I said, that's fair. I said, I point to the guy and I touch him. I said, what is this? He says, that's my hand. And I said, well, can you tell me who is this me that owns that hand? <laughs> and I saw something change in him. Um, you know, like, like I said before in other interviews and in other talks, what I get my joy from is when I, I play music in public a lot and I meet someone for the first time, one thing I've learned about him, when I meet someone for the first time, I on purpose look for one attribute, just one, that this person has that is worth acknowledging and admiring. And because of my focus and my intention and my passion to do it, I begin to admire that in a person in such a way, I literally see God walk out of that person right in front of my face. And the healing that begins to happen in that person's life by really listening to something or really appreciating a talent they have, um, I've seen it change people repeatedly. I have. Uh, thank you all for having me here today, Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, if you want to know more about me and my work, you can go to uh, thedivineprinciple.us. You can also go to the movie that has been made about my life at dowhatyoulovethemovie.com. Um, you can also find me on social media, Facebook, which is Keith Anthony Blanchard. Also another Facebook page. And they have different functionalities. I'm not, a, I'm not an egomaniac. They're, they're for certain reasons. And there's another one that is Keith Anthony Blanchard, author, I believe. Um, you can go to Amazon.com and order my book, uh, The Divine Principle, Anchoring Heaven on Earth. Uh, also, finally, uh, Eden Sky Wonders Why. You can buy on Amazon, which is a, a children's book series model after my son. And I do a radio show every Monday night, thanks to this man. And I'm really enjoying it. So, thank you. Keith, uh, I asked Keith if he would uh, be interested in taking on one of the shows. It was the original show, Searcher's Roadmap, that I had started. And he said, well, he said to me, look, I think I can do it through June. That was about two years ago. Thank you very much for being here.
this uh, four concepts can be seen by going to youtube.com and typing in Renford Broadcast Network. So if you're watching this uh, on YouTube, then you're seeing it there. If you've seen it somewhere else, you can go to uh, Renford Broadcast Network on YouTube and see at present probably 40 hours or better of these shows, the Bookman shows, and other uh, things coming from the Institute of Applied Metaphysics. I want to welcome, want to ask you or invite you to uh, go to uh, www.iam-cor.org. You can view the virtual campus of the Institute of Applied Metaphysics and see more about what we're doing. Thank you very much for being with us today on Core Concepts.